This episode of StoryWorthy is brought to you in part by Plated.com. Prepare chef-quality meals in 30 minutes or less with Plated. Head on over to Plated.com slash story and you'll get free shipping with your first order. That's Plated.com slash story. StoryWorthy Media. The best in story-driven content. Hey, this is comedian Murray Valeriano, and I'm here to plug my album, Rusty Cow, which you can get on iTunes, Amazon, or murrayvaleriano.com. And I'm here because I'm a fan of Storyworthy. Welcome to the Storyworthy Podcast. Here are your hosts, Christine Blackburn and Hannah Finney. Spinney and we're coming to you from Abbey Road Studios at 3 Abbey Road, London, Northwest 8. You know I've been there. You've been to, uh, well, yeah, right. You mean before now as we are in the mobile oh, yeah, of course. van of truth. Right. No, no, no. I came to Abbey Road the first time was like maybe 89, the first time I went to Europe. And, of course, did the did the picture barefoot across the across street. The street. You know, right. everybody kind of has to do that. But it is astounding what has come out of there. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing, and it's just uh, the the just the photograph is hilarious because recently they put up a bunch of like you know obviously for a still photograph you're taking hundreds and hundreds mm -hmm. of images, and you have the one iconic one, and then there's all these other photographs of the they're walking in a different order, they're walking in the other direction, right? They're just sitting there getting like they're you know they have a bored look on their face on the curb, getting their clothing tucked by the wardrobe people. It's just funny because you think of it as if it just happened. Right. And, of course, it didn't just happen. It was completely produced show business. Completely produced. And I'm glad they took as much footage as they did of the Beatles. I yeah. mean, there's a lot. There's a lot of, of history there. Yeah. there's a, Yeah, they probably are the first. Well, I don't know. Probably Elvis maybe, might have been the uh, first to Elvis get really covered in would, that way. That was just there's so much extra footage. But there's, there's I don't know, by the 60s. Even the eight millimeter film cameras were so ubiquitous. Yeah, you heard that's my word of the day. That's good, ubiquitous. man. I appreciate that. That uh, you know, there's you could probably find millions of miles of footage. All of right. The well, here's why we're talking about the Beatles because tonight on the show, finally, this right. has taken a long time yeah. to come to fruition. I'm not exactly sure why, but the guest tonight, Murray Valeriano, he brings forth the topic. I met a Beatle. Right. We've had people who met the president. Yeah. <laughs> Big fucking deal. Whatever. We've had people who've been on Seinfeld, like 10 people who've been on Seinfeld. Right. Um, Wendy Wilkins uh, fucked a movie star. That's right. told us about that. Um, but uh, never a Beatle. So never this a is Beatle. Exciting. Now, I've seen Paul McCartney in concert. But so I, I. And I've seen Ringo Starr in concert, but I've never seen the other two, and I've certainly never met any of them. Yes. The other two are dead, by the way. Yeah, I know that, but they weren't always. No, that's true. This is fantastic. I'm really excited that Murray Valeriano has brought forth this topic. You know, he also has a new comedy album out right now yes. called Rusty Cow. Do you see any correlation to how we finally got him on the show and then he had this album drop? <laughs> right, right. The album drop. Well, as he, as, you know, I would I would say the album, you know, you, he has an album on and you have a, a, I book, have a book out. I'm going to bring out a telegraph because <laughs> we're going to get all the dead media together and the three hey, of us listen, are going to Listen, uh, my book is also available on Kindle and the audio version. Ooh. Pit to LAX my story. By the way, who, uh, doesn't Anthony Hopkins read the audio version of your book? <laughs> Wouldn't, Wouldn't that, that be humorous? awesome if Anthony Hopkins were reading? <laughs> okay, here's what I want to talk about I with the Beatles. I was a stewardess. This okay, is that's exciting. Terrible I imitation. just actually read this this morning that I am Global is partnering with Vivek J. Tiri, I don't know how you say that, and Simon Cowell. Uh, Psycho Entertainment to co-produce the feature film version of The Fifth Beetle. So this is exciting it's based on Pete the Best. life of Beatles manager Brian Epstein. Oh, Brian, Brian Epstein. Epstein. Okay. So this is very exciting because, as you know, he is the one that discovered the Beatles basically in a cellar in Liverpool, and he's the one, Brian Epstein, who guided them to the worldwide success. Yes. Now, he died early, like yes. uh, 67, I think, Yeah, at the age of 32. Wow. He was so young that Paul McCartney is the one. He's the one who said Brian Epstein was the fifth Beatle. Right, right. So okay, that's see, very I thought exciting. it was Pete Best who was the original No, he was the drummer, drummer. but that was just a blink. That yeah. was kind of like, I don't think that was much. So this is basically about Brian Epstein and his inspiring vision 
uh, behind well, the Beatles. So well, that's coming out. You know, I'm excited. Wait, they're going to well, make no, it. No, it's coming out? or No, they're, yeah, they're going to make it. They're going to yeah, make it. Right. Okay, so if they ever make it, I'll go see it. Well, that's You're just great, reminding me honest. of the fact that, um, what's his name? Uh, uh, Borat. It's a guy. Yeah. Sasha Baron Cohen has been, they've been saying he's going to play Freddie Mercury in a biopic for eight years. I thought that was nine Russell Brand. Years. I thought Russell Brand is who they were nailing for that. That's that's the most recent rumor. Well, uh, it's not going to be you, and it's not going to be Andrew Steven. It might be Murray. He's tall could and lanky. Murray. <laughs> He's tall and lanky. He's pointing to his mouth that a dick could fit into. <laughs> oh. Oh, oh. See, oh. now I have oh, to mark it explicit. Ten minutes oh. ago, it was a family fun show, and now we get the explicit Freddie rating. Freddie Mercury-like cock. What is, it? what is your problem? What are you, anti-gay? I love Queen very much, as you so know. So did Freddie Mercury. And so... But... <laughs> Yes. No, right, so but he, I want to see Sasha Baron Cohen. It's like they've been saying they're going to make this movie forever, and right. it never gets made. Well, I and do this look movie, forward to that. Like, if you make a movie about the Beatles, I can see that'll get financed before a movie about Brian Epstein, even though I'm sure You're it wrong. is a fantastic story. You're wrong. It's going to be it's going to be a huge smash. Are you kidding? The Beatles fans are like, they cross generations, Hannes. I mean, it I just goes from people in their 80s, 70s, 60s, all the way down. All the way down except, to their 40s. Except, yeah, it, <laughs> I know. That's true. Then it drops off a bit yes. because nobody knows who they are. My well, daughter true, actually though. has a book called Meet the Beatles. Yeah. And when I read it to her, and now she can read it to me, yeah. I can't believe the words are coming out of her mouth that she didn't know this. Do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like everybody but Your father knows. didn't, didn't your father I start saying the Beatles were okay in 1980? My father thought I wrote yesterday. <laughs> so, and your mother very, thinks you have a podcast called Story World. Yeah, so they're really matter. not paying it doesn't attention. Matter. It doesn't matter. But I will say that I am a huge Beatles fan myself. One of my favorite movies ever is John Lennon is really who I love the most. And yeah. and that movie imagined that he did obviously it was posthumous, but it was his voice oh, doing okay. the entire right, right. doing the entire you know movie. The biography was with his voice and Yoko Ono's voice. And it yeah. was so beautiful, and they used such a ma- uh, amazing footage. That's a movie I could watch anytime. I want to watch a movie uh, about Brian Epstein and Yoko Ono having an affair and leave the Beatles out of it entirely. <laughs> that would be okay. I'm getting negative looks. You know, in the Julian room. Lennon is quite a, a singer songwriter himself, he's he very good. Yeah, and his mother recently died, Cynthia, Cynthia Lennon. That's she right, passed that's away right. just a few months John ago. Lennon, by the way, I think he used to smack women around. Well, I hate to tell you that. You don't have to bring it down like that. Well, don't turn I, I, that corner. I'm sorry. Seriously. He was the Bobby Brown of uh, Liverpool. I just, <laughs> I just I just, hope that's not true. I don't want that to be true. Uh, well, I don't know if he did. You know, maybe he did it on occasion. I mean, the guy was – here's the thing about – okay, think about this with the Beatles. This is where people don't think about it. Okay, so they were on – I'm not sure. Uh, I think in, like, 1962 is mm-hmm. when they were on uh, – they they were like twenty or twenty one, uh, yeah, right? Sullivan, yes. That means that they were born in nineteen sixty four. No, they were younger than that. I'm getting okay. So they were born in what? In the forties. In the forties. They were sure. born during World War Two. Yeah. So John Lennon any, was born in forty and died in nineteen eighty. Right. So if by any chance when he was eighteen years old, John Lennon hit a woman, his father was born in like eighteen hundreds. You know, it's <laughs> like it's amazing that there were people not hitting women in nineteen thirty five. I don't think it was ever acceptable. I think it might have been oh, tolerated, I think at one point but it, it wasn't was completely, acceptable. Oh no, no, no! I, you, I'm afraid to tell you that it was once completely acceptable. You were expected to hit your wife. <laughs> no. Why is this whole podcast turning to domestic violence? You're right. Let's get it back to cocksucking where it belongs. <laughs> no, I met a beetle, and now we're talking about wife beating. You're right. It's only a rumor. I don't know. John you Lennon's know, dead anyhow, so of, I should just leave him alone. Speaking of wife beating, I've been married twice. And at both of my weddings, I had a Beatles song played after yeah. they said, we you, now you pronounce might you man and wife. point out that neither one of your husbands actually beat you, because that was a weird transition you okay. just made there. <laughs> no, they didn't. Although the they, first one, we can blame The first him. one got somebody else pregnant. Yeah. That so was a hit in the face, but it wasn't he as was, blatant. He, 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 he smacked that me was, right. It was a passive, aggressive smack. Now, it's that like, song was a, it was, that was a beautiful but, wedding. Okay, it was an outdoor ceremony. At your first ceremony. wedding, what was the Beatles song that it played? Was, it went... Um, yeah, the opening love, love, La Marseillaise, love, 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 the French. And then it was the uh, whole love, love, love. Right, yes. all you need is love. The you realize second, the French, that was the French national anthem you just did. Okay. That's La Marseillaise. Okay. Do you, you want did. me to march? What do you want me to do? No, I want you to do sur- uh, surrender. Because the second you just wedding did the French national anthem. was also a very beautiful wedding. My dress was a little longer. Uh, I carried this time 
Daffodils. The yes. point is yes. that song. What was song, the song? I believe I cued it and missed the opening. You missed the cue. Thanks a lot, Hannes. Back in 2001. You'd still be married today if I had missed the That's cue. That's what I'm saying. Uh, and it went, uh, it was Paul McCartney, Maybe I'm Amazed. Yes. Maybe I'm amazed exactly. at the way you, you love me, me all, all the time. time. And now when I think back at that song, I'm amazed that we loved each other that long. Do you know what I mean? So yes. it <laughs> seems like wow. it yes. really kind of was a fore- foretelling of what, what was to come. Yeah, so we should really have a, a you know a song a that we can loser. play at the end of uh, weddings when they do the march and the song is like really. So the really? next time I get married, the song is going to be um, Maxwell Silver Hammer. Yes, that's that what I think be, we're going to have. That would be awesome, or perhaps Yellow Submarine. Yeah, or Dear Prudence. Something will something will come to me. No, no. Why don't we do it in the road? That oh yeah okay uh, that's dumb that was that the Beatles yeah I think it was wasn't it I'm pretty like, sure Paul somebody McCartney. was high when they that was Probably. on the White Album they had two full albums to fill <laughs> here's something that the kids will never know about and even if they listen to the White Album on iTunes they'll never know the joy of owning the White Album and then having a green streak down the center of it because everyone would separate the seeds out of their weed in the center of the White Album and then. Wow, Hannes, never... that's a heck of a good drug reference for somebody like for somebody... you who doesn't even smoke weed. I know. It was so ubiquitous that pe- you would just open – it. Would, oh, you have the white album. Let's play it. And you'd open it up, and it would be green in the center Yeah, every single time. Interesting. Huh. Yes. All right. Well, listen, before we bring on our storyteller tonight, I did want to mention that if you'd like to support the Storyteller podcast – Oh, he's ready, left already. He's long gone. That would be fantastic. Here's what you do. Number one, follow us on Twitter. This is simple. Right. At okay. Storyworthy. Follow us on Instagram. Guess what that is? At Storyworthy. It's unbelievable. Uh, we also have what they call a website, storyworthypodcast.com, or cut to the chase, the parent company. Yeah, storyworthy. <laughs> I'm the parent. Storyworthymedia.com. Right. That's right. the bridge. That's the whole over. It's part of Amco. Thing. Part- <laughs> that's the big one. Yes. You can also just tell a friend, and really that's the way we get the most traction. Yes. Somebody, you just tell a friend, hey, I'm listening to this show. It's easy to listen to. Stitcher, SoundCloud, iTunes. It's available everywhere. <laughs> that should be a slogan. It's easy to listen to. You'll never have to think. <laughs> never. There's God a bunch forbid. of dumb jokes. And some here's dick what else humor, you can do. Head uh, on over to Amazon.com, purchase my book, Pit to LAX, My Story Worthy Life. Do you see how many right. reviews I have, Hannes? 300. No, no, not 35. that many, but about 30. Yeah, about 30. I'm, I'm okay. feeling good about that. I'd like to get 50. That's what yeah. I'd like to get. So please, leave me a review on Amazon, whether you read the book or not. That's what I'm saying. Right. Just, yeah, yeah. you don't have to buy it. or re- You just go on and you go, this is the greatest yeah. book I've ever read. That's what I'm saying. We're asking you to lie to your fellow citizens. That's not that hard. That's really not. All right, you guys, wherever you are, stick around, because Marie Valeriano is on his way here. Next time on Storyworthy, we have author and artist Jonathan Shaw. I'm going to be reading a, uh, uh, an excerpt from uh, my book, Narcissa, Our Lady of Ashes, that deals uh, primarily with the phenomena of craving, or otherwise known as addiction. That's next time on Storyworthy. Hey, Hannes, let's talk about our new sponsor, Plated. Yeah, now they help a guy like me who loves to eat. But really, I, I don't like to shop, and I'm not that good of a cook. It's true. These people bring you ingredients, the yeah. proper ingredients to cook a healthy, awesome meal. Oh, my gosh. This is, like, such a perfect company for you, hon. Well, it's perfect for a lot of people, like empty nesters or millennials or working parents. Oh, like those me. millennials, I tell you. <laughs> no, but it's for people who want to, you know, be in the kitchen. They want to create meals, but right. they You're don't like, want to do all that preparation. I right, mean, and also, I, know what and I don't buy. even know how to do the preparation. I go I to the, I go to the store, and I look on the shelf. I'm like, I don't know which is the good one and which is the bad one. Right. I don't know where things are. They're like eliminating the middleman. Exactly. So maybe you guys have heard about Plated from that show Shark Tank. Shark Tank. Plated, you guys. It's for people who love cooking fresh, exciting new dishes, but don't have the time to find all those perfect ingredients. And not that I care, but you know it's a great way to impress a date. That's right. Somebody comes over and you say, look at this, honey. Let's just Look what I just made up. Right. But you want to take it out of the plated box. So that she doesn't know that you didn't have, you didn't bother to go to the store yourself. All right, you guys, prepare chef quality meals in 30 minutes or less with Plated. Head on over to plated.com slash story now and get free shipping with your first order. Once again, that's plated.com slash story. I'm Greg Barron, and you're listening to Storyworthy with the side of your face.
Hey, Christine, let's talk about our new sponsor, BoxyCharm. Oh, my gosh. I love these guys, Hannes, BoxyCharm. It's like a beauty subscription box that sends you full-size products in the mail, like cosmetics and skincare, hair care, stuff like that. Yeah, it's only $21 a month. Right. Uh, free shipping, no long-term commitment. You can cancel at any time. And you might be like me. You have to have a subscription box explained to you. But uh, no. <laughs> no, this is really cool. BoxyCharm in, in the box is like $95 worth of products. So recently I got my first BoxyCharm box. Mm-hmm. And inside was a full-size coral lipstick and a full-size coral nail polish. Mm-hmm. Now, I would That's never... kind of a very light blue. No, no, no. Like coral, s- coral. Sea green. The point is I would never have bought these for myself. Right. Right? And I'm thinking, hmm, that's interesting. Next thing you know, I'm going through Oprah Ma- Oprah's magazine. You know that magazine? Is it called Oprah? It's called O. Oh, there's oh, big O on the front. She's on the cover every month. I don't know why. But the point is, I look, I'm look. i looking through the magazine. Guess what they're highlighting? The color of the summer is coral. Coral. See that? Uh, Foxy Charms. They the were way of the ahead of you. They these knew guys before are good. you did. Yeah, these guys are good. It's a perf- It's perfect for treating yourself, uh, your wife, your girlfriend, your fiancé, Hannes. I'm sorry, what? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> Head on over to BoxyCharm.com and tell them what else they have there, Hannes. If you're still not sold, you can search BoxyCharm on YouTube and access thousands of unboxing videos. Those are hilarious. People are unboxing videos and scream, oh, my God, and they scream and they cry and then they put lipstick on. <laughs> and we're back. We've gone about a mile away from Abbey Road Studios to 221B Baker Street, to the Sherlock Holmes Museum. Oh, that would be cool, I think. It would be cool. We'll go inside right after we finish our show. Do you know on my first um, honeymoon, I went to Europe. We went to London, and my ex-husband was a musician, and we went on a Jimi Hendrix tour. I mean, nice. he made up the tour. Yeah. Of where, you know, like, with, this is where Jimi Hendrix played. This is where he set his guitar on fire. This is where he <laughs> died. You know, but uh, and people you that are married this in, guy. And I yeah. married him. I know. What an idiot. But yeah. people that are into music like that, boy, they'll go... Well, I, I shouldn't well, I criticize. Would go, like, I would, on a, I'd like to go on the Game of Thrones tour where you, where you go t- in Northern Ireland. Yeah. You go see all the places. Did I tell you I by. finally watched Game of Thrones, Hannes? I finally watched it on the airplane recently. I watched two episodes. Yeah. It was good, man. Really it's, good. It's amazingly good. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's just uh, so rare to see actors and writers and directors and – and cinematography, everybody's at the top of their game. Everybody's collaborating. Everybody, but it's like, it's just, there's no drop off. Yeah. You know, sometimes you'll see a show and you're like, this actor is amazing, but it looks terrible, or it looks great, but the scripts are terrible. Uh, it's it's and it's just hard to. How could they fit Paul McCartney into Game of Thrones, Hannes? Could that oh, that would be awesome. You know, he can be the. Uh, a oh, lord what is, of one no, of the No, he can be from the uh, north. Yeah. He can be one of the zombie guys. Yeah. Uh, oh, that would be great if That's it turns plausible. out that the true king of of uh, Westeros is Paul McCartney. They, can, they all have a big war, and then he comes <laughs> out. He's like, hello. <laughs> I'm going to sit on the Iron Throne. I am. I know. That's not remotely Paul McCartney's accent. <laughs> I understand. I can't. Do All right, a Liverpool guys. accent. Our I apologize. Storyteller is here right now. His name is Murray Valeriano, and he is a comedian and a writer. You've seen him on Comedy Central and NBC, and he has written Hannes for The Tonight Show starring Jimmy Fallon and The Tonight Show starring Jay Leno. What? You see how that went? How that crossed over? Wow. He's also written for Bill Engvall's Here's Your Sign Awards, and he is the host of the Road Stories podcast. Yes. Now he has a brand new comedy album out, like I mentioned, called Rusty Cow. Do you know what that means, Hannes? Rusty Cow. <laughs> is it like a rusty trombone? If you this see is the obvious, if question. you see the album cover, you'll see what it is. There's a baby bottle, and a bottle of whiskey, That's or a, a shot of whiskey. Cow. So there's like there, he, he's spiking the baby's milk. That's I what prefer I think the we've Danny learned. Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> in which you get underneath a glass, glass table. Glass table. All right. Murray uh, Venuccio <laughs> gets on top of the table. Murray after Valeriano. Having a, okay, we should let Listen, him Listen, you guys, story. you can find Rusty Cow over at iTunes and everywhere you get fine media. And you can find Murray on Twitter at Murray V and at MurrayValeriano.com. All right, you guys, wherever you are, put your hands together for Murray Valeriano. So my story takes place just a couple of years ago. Um... Now, not to sound controversial or anything, but I'm a huge Beatles fan. Um, I know that's, uh, that's easy to say. People our age probably discovered the Beatles in college, probably when they discovered pot. Um, so when they discovered the Beatles. I discovered the Beatles when I was five, which was the year I discovered pot also. <laughs> no. um, I remember hearing my first uh, Beatles song. It was Let It Be. It was in my dad's radio. And I thought, oh, man, this song is great. This song is great. And I asked my dad who it was. He said it was the Beatles. Now, it's pretty easy 
for me to get into the Beatles at five because I had two older brothers. So I'd sneak into their uh, sneak into their room and listen to their albums and and you know get to really learn Abbey Road, Sgt. Pepper's, Meet the Beatles, all that. It got rough when I got into high school and other uh, other kids were writing like Duran Duran on their uh, <laughs> book, Ozzy Osbourne, and I was writing the Beatles and Paul McCartney, and uh, that was rough because all the other Ozzy fans would be like, dude. Paul McCartney would get his head bit off by Ozzy Osbourne if he had the chance. <laughs> to which I'd reply, Paul McCartney would never bite Ozzy Osbourne's head off because, honest, Paul McCartney's a vegetarian. <laughs> and that, stuff like that would get me punched. But needless to, uh, needless to say, I found another friend in my friend Rich DeAndre who also loved Paul McCartney and the Beatles, so it was great. So this was the 80s. Paul had released a few albums, but they were uh, solo albums, so they were like the Say, Say, Say period, the Ebony and Ivory period. Not exactly, it was a dark period for Paul, let's be honest. But the end of the 80s, man, he releases this album called Flowers in the Dirt. And this was the album, man. This was the comeback album of Paul McCartney. This was going to be his, his, his back to true form, Paul McCartney. And on top of the album, he was going to uh, do a world tour which he hadn't done since like 1975 with Wings, all right? And so on top of the album and on top of the tour, he was also going to play Beatles songs that he'd never played live before, which was awesome. I don't know if you guys know, but the Beatles stopped touring in like, oh boy, 65, 66, because it was basically you go to a Beatles concert, you just hear teenage girls screaming. <laughs> that was just it. It was like, it was just like teenage screaming girls. There's actually video of John Lennon playing the keyboard, just banging on the keyboard and running his elbow up and down the keyboard and singing gibberish because it didn't matter. All you heard was, yeah. was teenage girls screaming, you know? So you bought a ticket for the Beatles, you basically bought a ticket for teenage girls screaming. So he hadn't played any of the Beatles, Beatles songs before. So I'm stoked. My friend Rich and I are stoked, man. This is great. This is great. And it was such a big tour, and, and I saw him at Giant Stadium. So it was New York City. So there was all this lead up. There was, he was doing late night television. There were articles in the paper. <laughs> Uh, they gave all 60 minutes of 60 minutes to Paul McCartney the Sunday night before, which was awesome. And that was the first time I ever watched 60 minutes <laughs> because I was a teenager. So it was great. So I went and I got tickets for the concert. And it was now I'm very young in the concert, so I don't know anything about buying tickets. You know, uh, I didn't I just at the time you could just walk in. You could say, give me two tickets and they give you two tickets and then you go and sit somewhere. You know, I didn't know anything about sections. I didn't know anything about mezzanines. I didn't know what a loge was. I still don't know what a loge is. <laughs> As a matter of fact. So I just bought tickets. I bought tickets for a ticket for me and a ticket for my girlfriend. And then I bought a ticket for my friend Rich and our friend Brian. So it was four tickets and they were what they call obstructed view. <laughs> so... I didn't know what obstructive view is. I know what obstructed meant, and I knew what view meant, but I didn't know what obstructed view meant when it came to concerts. So we go to the concert, and we sit down, and we got the perfect view of a pole. Just full-on pole, nothing but just pole. But we didn't care. We're going to see Paul McCartney. We didn't care. We really care. Well, we're actually going to hear Paul McCartney. We're not going to see him. We're going to sit behind a pole for the next two and a half hours. So we're sitting there just having a good time. I didn't care. I was going to, you know, it was all Paul McCartney. And I noticed this guy walking up and down the stairs. And uh, I noticed him for two reasons. A, he had uh, credentials on, which I didn't know what credentials were at the time, but he had credentials on. And then there was something. I'm like, dude, that dude looks familiar, man. Why do I, where do I know that dude from? And it uh, dawned on me. He was on 60 Minutes with Paul McCartney. I'm like, Rich, wasn't the dude on 60 Minutes? He's like, yeah, he was on 60 Minutes. I'm like, sweet, what's he doing here? And he walked up to us and said, in a British accent, which I won't do, he said, hey, Mr. McCartney holds aside a few extra tickets for people with obstructed view. Uh, if you'd like to trade your tickets for these, you'd have better seats. And I said, oh, all right, are you sure they're better? Than the, like, I literally asked that. Like, are you sure they're better than sitting behind this pole? Because this pole is very nice. He's like, yeah, I don't know. I was like, okay, well, I got two friends up top there. Can they, uh, can they have two tickets too? He's like, sure. So he gives us a ticket, trade them. We go down to the field level. I was like, oh, field level, this is great. And so we hand our tickets to the uh, usher. And uh, the usher goes, oh, Follow me. And I got very like, oh, okay. So he walks us. It's 100 seats back, 100 rows back. And he walks us 100, 95, 90, 80, 75, 50, row 45, row 40, row 20, row 15, row 10, row 5, 4, 3, 2, fucking front row. Right? So we're like, what? And, and this is awesome. He goes, it gets even better. He goes, there are 100 seats across. This is seat one. The other end is seat 100. 
you guys are seat 48, 49, 50, and 51. <laughs> Dead fucking center, right? So we're like stoked. We go, we sit down. This couple next to us paid $500 for theirs, which was huge at the time. And so uh, since this was a big tour, they had this uh, uh, movie. The, since this was his comeback tour, they rolled a 10-minute movie, which spanned the life of Paul McCartney from you know the, the Hamburg days all the way up to Flowers in the Dirt. So we watched this whole movie. It was great. And then out walks Paul and like Hofner bass, his you know, signature Hofner bass and everything. And I just go ballistic, jump up, scream, and me and Rich are screaming like teenage girls. It was great. It was a, it was the best concert experience of my life. But you're probably saying, Mer, I thought this story took place a couple years ago. Well, it did. Here's what happened. Uh, a few years ago, I go to England for the BAFTA Awards. The BAFTA Awards are uh, the British Academy Awards, basically. Academy Awards and Emmy Awards. Um, they combine them all together. So my wife was nominated for a BAFTA. So we, we, fly, to, we fly to London. Uh, it was great. It was sponsored by Grey Goose. It was a drunk weekend. <laughs> it was awesome being toted all around London just drinking breakfast, Grey Goose, lunch break. It was great. So we go to the BAFTA Awards. Now, this was the year of uh, the King's Speech, the King's Speech movie. So the King's Speech is about the British king, and it was shot in England. It was all about England. So naturally... It's going to win fucking everything, right? So everybody was over there. They, they're like, everybody who flew over there from my wife's movie was like, we're not going to win. We're just here for the party. <laughs> sure enough, King's Speech just sweeps everything. So the end of the uh, ceremony is like the best score or best song. And uh, the host was this uh, comedian named Jonathan Ross, who was uh, it's like, uh, he's like, uh, stop trying to make a picture. <laughs> it was Jonathan Ross. He's like um, our, our Johnny Carson over there. So he goes, hey, who? Uh, I think it was Chris Martin was supposed to give out the best song or best score, but uh, he couldn't make it. He fell ill. So I asked my friend Paul. So Paul, so it turns out to be Paul McCartney. My wife and I go nuts. This is great. We get to see Paul McCartney, free Grey Goose, and we get to see Paul McCartney. This is awesome. What a, what a great trip. So we finish. Nobody wins any awards. My wife didn't win any awards. Nobody wins any awards. But there's a big after party. And so uh, my wife goes, all right, uh, let's go to the after party. And But first, I want to go to the bathroom and freshen up. It's like, okay. So we go upstairs. We go to the bathroom. My wife's like, hold my purse. I'm like, okay, I'll hold your purse. So I'm sitting down in the hallway holding her purse, and this big ruckus starts. And uh, coming up the stairs, it's paparazzi, bzz, 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 flash, you know, lights flashing, and, and, you know, people waving pencils and records. And it walks by, and it's Colin Firth. And he had just won Best Actor. I'm like, oh, that's cool. You know, everybody's surrounding Colin Firth. So they take off. They're about 10 feet away from me. I'm watching all this commotion, sitting there holding my wife's purse like Ruth Buzzy, <laughs> right up under my chin, you know. And I'm just watching this whole thing call down, and out of the corner of my eye, uh, two guys walk up, and one guy goes, I got to go to the bathroom. And the other guy, in his you know, distinctive voice of Paul McCartney, oh, go right ahead. And I'm like, oh, shit, that's Paul McCartney, <laughs> right? And so he's standing there alone because all the media is around Colin Firth, and I'm standing by the bathroom holding my wife's purse. <laughs> and I've literally had 15 conversations in my head in like three seconds, right? I'm like... Should I go talk to him? I can't go talk to him. I don't want to go talk to him. I'll never have this chance again to talk to him. But you know what? This is England. Probably in England, you don't go approach Paul McCartney. And I literally said in my mind, fuck it. I'm American. <laughs> hey, Paul, Murray Valeriano, nice to meet you. And he, and he shook his hand. And I said, I said, you know, for the millionth time today, you probably heard this, but I'm a huge fan of yours. And, and he said, oh, thank you very much. And then, all right, when you meet celebrities in these situations, they have this wall, right? You know, they have this wall up. And so he had his wall up, and, and we're shaking hands. And after I said I'm a huge fan, he said, thank you. There was nothing. There was nothing. I mean, there was no paparazzi around. Nobody was asking him questions. So it got kind of awkward. So I was like, uh, you know, I saw you in the 80s on the Flowers in the Dirt tour at Giant Stadium. And that wall, I don't know what I said, but that wall went right down. And he said, oh, really? Flowers in the Dirt? I'm like, yeah, Giant Stadium. He's like, I remember that show. We did two shows there. And I told him the whole story about me rich the tickets the front row the obstructed view the whole thing he's like oh that was one of my favorite tours i really really uh really did we're still holding we're still shaking hands by the way he's like yeah i remember that that was that was a great tour and he's like that's the one you liked i was like yeah man i was like it's the, it was the greatest musical experience of my life and then some one paparazzi goes mr mccartney and takes a picture and that wall whoosh, went right back up it went right back up and i said listen paul i'm just a huge fan thank you this was great and he goes oh Thanks. I think I'm pretty good at what I do. <laughs> and then they were just he was just engulfed by paparazzi. And I went back and I sat next to the girls' bathroom waiting for my uh, wife. I picked up my phone. I called my friend Rich. I'm like, Rich, guess what? He's like, what? 
I just met Paul McCartney. He's like, no way. And we screamed like teenage girls. Oh, <laughs> that's the best oh. story. That's a great story, man. That's awesome. See, so here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking any number of things. First of all, Colin Firth is there surrounded. He could probably see Paul McCartney from where he was. Probably. And in Colin Firth's mind, he's thinking, how long until all these people go, hey! Right. What? Oh, you're an actor. That's nice. And living icon. And desert me in a second. Right, That's right. almost thinking in show business. It's always somebody higher up. Mm -hmm. And you don't get higher up. Than, a, than Paul fucking McCartney. No, you really don't. You really don't. Like, Paul McCartney would never have to worry that, not that he would probably even care, but it's like, if he's surrounded by paparazzi and, and Colin Firth walks in, he doesn't think anybody's going to leave him to go take a picture of Colin Firth. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. never going to happen. Well, I don't think he's even thinking that anyway. Right, exactly, because he doesn't have to, because it's like, <laughs> never going to. By yeah. the way, Paul McCartney looks damn good, man. He's aging really well, isn't he? He looks so good. He doesn't have too much plastic surgery. I don't know how much he's had. I think mm. he's probably had some, but he's very graceful. Of course, he c colors his hair. Of, of course. course, he has an image. That I get that. I yeah, get yeah. that. Uh, but his talent is so effortless. Oh, yeah. He plays the guitar like like we're breathing. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's, there can be no, um, there's no mistakes. No. You know who's aging better? Yeah. Ringo, believe it or not. Ringo is. Ringo's aging. Like, he still looks the same. He looked in like 82. How That's tall true. was Paul He's one of those guys I think he looked older than he was much earlier. Because he was the oldest Beatle. Speaking yeah, of but Coke, I'm, that's probably what aged him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> just like like the fact that I've been balding forever, mm -hmm. I think causes me, people are not like, wow, you went bald. It's like, they're like, oh, you look pretty good for a guy who I thought looked like he was 50 20 <laughs> years ago. 53 you know? always. He's always yeah, been 53. Well, I, was, I was gray. I've been gray since I was 20. But yeah. you're like a so, debonair gray. And uh, that's, that's what happens the gray with the, men. Now, tell me the truth. You got the gray on the sides. Uh, do, you, do you do any of the back, or is it just this is your hair? No, I gray some of the back also. Yeah, okay. <laughs> what, what are you talking about? No, no, I mean, do what to I, the mean, back? I mean, is your head, like, do you do you color any of the other stuff brown? No, no, this is all dude, this is. This is all myrrh right it's here. It's natural. <laughs> what movie was your wife nominated for? Uh, True Grit. Now, she's a costume oh, designer. Damn, yes. that's a good movie. And she really, so she did True Grit. That's mm -hmm. amazing. And she's been a costume designer forever? Uh, I don't know about forever, but a long time. A long time. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you're winning she's Academy been alive Awards, forever. She's yeah, like she Kevin, has if you're winning Academy Awards, you're accomplished. I mean, yeah. So that's fantastic. Yeah, she's great. What are the other big movies that she's done? Uh, uh, I should know this. Um, uh, never heard of it. I know. Hold on. Sorry. Well, she, you know what she does? All, she's the Coen Brothers uh, costume designer, so she wow. does all the Coen yeah, Brothers. Yeah, no awesome. kidding. So yeah. she did Fargo. That was her first, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. Boy, did she nail that? Oh, did she? But guess what? She didn't meet Paul McCartney. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so fuck her, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh yeah. How'd your wife react when you come out and you go, "Hey, guess who I met while you were in the toilet?" Oh, you know what's funny is she came out and she literally looked at me. And she said, "What's wrong?" Because I like I left and I literally started sweating. Yeah. Like I kept yeah. my cool while I was talking right. to him, but then I went back and it all kind of sank in. She's like, "What wrong?" I was like, "When I'm you fucking met Paul McCartney." When you did meet him, was he taller than you? Because you're tall. You're, you're six uh, foot. No, he wasn't taller than me. How tall are you? Six think. foot. I'm six one. If I don't slouch. If you don't, uh huh. You shouldn't slouch. I try not to, but yeah. now one time I saw the Paul uh -oh. McCartney Stay concert. Um, it was for his wife Linda, who had just passed away. Sure. And it was at Paramount Studios, and they had a big night uh, for breast cancer and to celebrate her. It was 1999, I believe. 99 or 2000. And you know who I she saw? She died in 99, I think. Then it was 2000. Right. But it was an amazing event with Sarah McLachlan and uh, the, the, the B-52s right. were there. Right, I heard about them. Do you remember that? I didn't go, go but my friend Mike Siegel went. Who yeah, I think you know. right. I know okay. Mike Siegel, of course. And so I was at that show, and you know who I ran into in the bathroom? And it was, it was very hot at the time. Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> and the other person in the bathroom was Pam Anderson. So here my I God, am. God, this is the hottest story. I know, seriously. Then, why then why what am happened? I telling my McCartney story? You <laughs> yeah, gotta tell uh, the so, whore in the bathroom oh, story. Right, the penthouse so forum. Interesting. But that happens <laughs> in Hollywood. I never Hollywood. thought it would happen to me. <laughs> but that happens in Hollywood. You know, now you met Paul McCartney you know, at the arena. Oh. What, what, which arena was that, by the way, where you met him? Or that was at the awards? The yeah, it was at the Baptist. The it was the. Uh, now the, uh, the Royal Opera House. Well, when you're at an event like that, you're going to run into a celebrity sooner or later, like in the bathroom or in the. Because that's where they're at. Right? Yeah, but and they I usually mean, have and handlers and, and... Yeah, but they got to get a drink. I mean, they're going to the bar. In other words, that's what surprises me about some of these fancy events in Los Angeles mm -hmm. or like an award show is that there isn't more people around them. In other words, if Paul McCartney has to go to the bathroom, mm -hmm. nobody's walking him to the bathroom. He's just going to go. 
Right? I, I disagree. I, usually there is. And I think his handler went to the bathroom. I think that's the guy who left. And uh, So know, he didn't say, Paul, come with me. No, Paul just decided because to stay out there. Well, the I don't blame him. Worse. There's a good example of why a celebrity be alone. Yeah. Th- that's my yeah. point. Is Or if he so, wants... If you go to an award show, hang out near the bathroom. I think this is the lesson. Every, this is everybody lesson. poops. That's, yeah. that's what that book's about, right? <laughs> All that, beaches am I wrong? poop. I that would have been a much a, better yeah. version of the every celebrity I, I, poops. You're making me think of the time where you just run into people. I used to. I've told the story before. It's not even much of a story, but I uh, worked at the at a job at the CNN building in Hollywood, and uh, you know it's at Hollywood Boulevard and uh, no, it's on Sunset no, it's Boulevard. Sunset, Sunset Boulevard across from the Amoeba. Right and. Um, I had some job, had nothing to do with CNN. I'm riding down in the elevator. I'm riding down the elevator in the CNN building, and the door elevator is full, and the door opens, and standing, ready to stand, walk in the elevator, Larry King. <laughs> and he looks at everybody in the elevator, looks at him like, duh. And he goes, hello. <laughs> and I was like, that's perfect. And that was like, you know how many? But the wall, how Mil- many times? Milwaukee, that, Wisconsin. Go. Hello. Hello. I don't know. It's what like he knows from. what uh, you know. He knows what to say. And you're right about the wall. It's like famous people, and they have to. It's like, I mean, just imagine, you know, being recognized, being able to be recognized by literally everyone on earth. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot of pressure, that's man. Amazing. You're talking about Larry King, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, no. Okay. No. I'm talking about uh, Pierce <laughs> Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen. When it comes to music, I mean, clearly it it translates across the world. So you know, yeah. like India has its Bollywood stars, and we've got our Hollywood stars. But when you're talking about musicians, it's yeah, you're everywhere. right. It's a whole yeah. other. It's a whole other thing. Like Johnny Carson used to say, he would go to uh, he would go to see Wimbledon because he loved tennis, and he would go to England, and you know, Americans would be like, oh, hey, Johnny. And everybody else knew who he was. And he said he could stand that for about a week. Yeah. And he's like, he wanted I got to go back, back, where, people yeah, get back well, where people know who I am. It's funny because I told that, I, when I tell that story, I, told, I, I had a couple uh, EPs on the last show I was on from England. And we were talking about the BAFTAs. And I said, yeah, this guy, Jonathan Ross hosted. And that was, there's, there's Johnny Cotton. He's like, of course, Jonathan Ross. He's yeah. the biggest, I he's the biggest yeah. talk, no, you know. Seen, I've seen a million ads for his show on BBC America. Right, right. I've never actually seen the show. He was great as a host. Okay, man. so Murray, no, you're sure. from Memphis, Tennessee. I was born in Memphis, Tennessee, but I pretty much grew up in Jersey. Yeah, because you have no accent or anything. Well, I was born in Tennessee. I live in Indiana, Jersey, California, so all my accents kind of cancel each other out. And you've yeah. been a comedian now for a long time, <laughs> like 25 years, 20 years. No, no. Since '99, 2000. Yeah. That's okay, 15 years. years. 15 yeah. years. Well, professionally. Uh, because now you seem uh, to be um, headlining a lot. Yeah. At different improvs. That seems to be your club. Yeah, that's the one I go to the most. Yeah. All across the country. Yeah. And do you love? So, in other words, if you had a preference, improv, comedy store, whatever. Oh, would, improv you, by far. But I you mean, for the road. Of the yeah. Ice House too. Oh yeah, I love the Ice House. The Ice House is where I got started. I got started out here. But that's so more I'm like always... a little tiny Pasadena club. You're talking about. Yeah, the there's club. The, the Ice House isn't. Um, a chain, so it's just here in Pasadena. I see. Um, the improvs are all of the So country. you're like an improv touring yeah. person. Yeah, yeah, mostly. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I go to other clubs too, but the improv is just great. And so, do you ever? Do you always feel good about getting a laugh when you're on the road? Do I always feel good about getting a laugh? Yeah. Now I do. I used to feel like shit. When really? I got a laugh. Well, I because know. you felt like what? I felt very cheap. I didn't really, you know. You you guys did stand up, you know, like. You, I didn't like what I was doing when you get like I know Christine and Hannes from years back the open mic almost yeah. open mic scene. Yeah. So when you're starting out, you're writing whatever, and you just don't feel you know it, it takes a while to find out what you really want to talk about, and, and you're and so like early on, I was I just I didn't like what I was doing, and it took me a very long time. So a lot yeah. of times I'd feel yeah. like crap, just like nah. so I mean I had good, I had good sets, like, but sometimes you deliberately you know I mean it's it's like a cliche, but you'll be on the road and you just deliberately do some shitty joke that you know is literally beneath you. Oh, you, It's the biggest laugh you get all night. I know. And in, in the back like, of your head, you're like, all right, nobody's here to see this. See. Or do you think, like, you guys shouldn't laugh at that. Don't laugh at that. It's too easy. I softball. I'm playing softball. I never said that to them, but that's what I would yeah, say. Yeah, that's what you, you know. Well, can I say, this is, I, I think of, I was, I, I went back, after years of not being in Milwaukee, I went back to my old club, the Comedy Cafe, perhaps mm-hmm. you've heard of it, and um, I went and I was doing the material I'd written in performed in LA and it's just fucking going nowhere right and you know three two days into the th- five day gig the guy's like I'm gonna pay you for the whole thing but Ooh. I gotta let you go and he brought in a guy to replace me from Chicago and it was the first the my last set we both went on uh-huh. and this guy literally did a joke about masturbating so much 
that your palms get so hairy that you look like Chewbacca. And they go, and does the Chewbacca sound. It was two <laughs> hack jokes really funny combined into one. Well, two really of the worst fucking funny. hack jokes in the world. That's my closer and I'm on like, SD and, they, and they're like, wah! And I'm like, I'm fucking, maybe I, I don't know what I'm doing. Sounds funny to me, man. Uh, well, that's the other thing is you got to... <laughs> You gotta know your audience. I mean, if this I is know, what they're there to see, this is what they're there to see. And who knows? Maybe that guy thinks it's brilliant. Maybe, yeah. You know, I mean, maybe the audience obviously. thought it was the greatest joke that's what they'd I'm ever saying. heard. So that's the as, audience. as long as you can, it, this is how I look at stand up. As long as you can step off, step off the stage, no matter if you killed or if you bombed, and were proud of what you did, mm. then you're a fucking winner. Interesting. That's, that's my right. Thing. And, and if I did that joke, I wouldn't be proud of myself. Right. Exactly. Well, Hannes always says you're not as good as you think, and you're not as bad as you think. You know what? That's I like that. You like yeah. You never you never suck as because when you have a tough show, that's a good you point. Come I like off that. You're like, yeah. oh God, I, I, you know, I mean, people want. I'm 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 not going to get out of her life. People want to kill me. People go, oh, that was good. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. like there. Where do you want to go for lunch? It's tomorrow? never. Like, yeah. It's, it's never as bad as you think. Well, there's ever. also you're kind of attuned to hearing a certain response now. I, I know, like my uncle, I don't ever seen that guy crack a smile in his life, yeah. you know, but he yeah. will tell me, oh man, I had such a good time at, tonight at Christmas. I'm like, I couldn't tell, so <laughs> you yeah, know, but so there's different, straight face. Yeah, there's yeah. different yeah. reactions. So you get people who are having a blast, but they just, they just don't, they just say that's very funny. Yeah. They just don't emote laughter or emotion yeah. that much. Right. Yeah. I, I know that. the worst, yeah, the worst thing you can, well, one of the worst things you can have as a comedian is the nodding audience. Mm. Uh, it's like, ah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, they're looking. Mm, they're not even so, saying the words. That's funny. They're just nodding like, so I approve me, of this joke. No, I is, like the supportive hecklers. <laughs> you know, you do. Like, that's right. That's right. That's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> He's heckling that's right. in a supportive. Yeah, way. in a supportive. So, and it's really hard to that. shut those guys down because you're like, yeah, I know like, you're. I know you're on my team. <laughs> I know your team. But, but guess what? I do a solo. Yeah, yeah. Not doing a brother act yeah. today. So what is Hanging it like, up John Oates? Uh, what is it like? <laughs> <laughs> what is it like now touring, or do you tour with a child? Um, I I do I do it like one week a month, one weekend a month. I took like four months off uh, when we stay at home dad, so I didn't do because much. when your wife's working, if she's on a big project mm-hmm. as a costume designer, that's got to take precedence, obviously, yeah. Um, it doesn't take precedence. We, I mean, it does, but then when she's off, my wrote and I also write for TV, so that takes precedence. So we we try to switch it up to. You know, so she can work, and then she can have time with the kid, and I can work, and I can but have time with the kid. But going on the road now, you enjoy that or not? I do. I love it. I'm going on. I do. I love it, and I know a lot of people hate it, but I'm also fortunate to be able to go out one week a month and not go out 42 weeks a year. Right. right. I think also, that makes a big difference. Yeah. Yeah, and also you can sleep in and take a shower uninterrupted, <sighs> and when you have a three-year-old, you can drink. That's not the way. When you're yeah. in a hotel room alone, you can you can sleep and masturbate as much as you want. And when you have a three-year-old, I've been late for shows. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> that's no good. <laughs> no, but it's the truth. Like everybody, like I'm going to Vegas to do the improv next month, and everybody's like, "Oh man, you're gonna gamble, you're gonna drink." I'm like, grab a bottle of scotch, and yeah. I'm going to my hotel room after yeah. every show, and I'm fucking well, watching movies. Is, when you have and I'm a sleeping, child, and I'm going to the gym. When you have a child, you can't you can't party so hard because you you have to be able to wake up if there's a problem. Yeah, yeah. You you can't just pass out. No, no. Even I, when you're sleeping, it's not your time. Yeah, they're not even going to, there's no guarantee that they're going to sleep through the night. No, so, no I mean, I, I learned that right. the hard way and early on. And what if on. there's an earthquake or something? I mean, you have oh, to yeah. kind of be on your toes. You got to be on your toes. What did you learn early on? What, that just because they fall asleep doesn't mean they're sleeping all the way through. Yeah. yeah. I remember one of my first nights alone with him, he, cra- he fell asleep. I'm like, oh, that was easy. Glug, 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 glug. <laughs> Started drinking scotch at the two o'clock in the morning. I'm like, oh, man. Yeah, Drag well, myself out of bed. Remember that would happen. Uh, What's wrong? What's wrong? What's your favorite part about being a dad? Um, When when he wants me to look at something. Aww. When he says, Daddy, look at this. Yeah. I think it's great. Because yeah. it's so like innocent, anything, isn't it? Even yeah, yeah. And it's, so and it's anything. It could be a pencil to, you know. Take now, are you deliberately toy. playing Beatles songs around your son because you want him to do what you did at five years old? And go. This song is great. Um, no, but my kid loves music, and I'm very proud of that. And he yeah, loves to dance. That's a great question, Hannes. Yeah. What is the music you play at home? Uh, any kind. He likes any kind of danceable. Any kind he can shake his ass to. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, the the song he uh, he likes is uh, "So Lonely" by the Police. Oh, really? That's yeah. funny. So it kicks into that, and so yeah. he jumps around. And my daughter, she's so into music. I play so much music around her. She knows it. She can nail Lucinda Williams. She sure. knows from. You well, know. you don't realize when you're a kid how that soaks in. I just. 
I just wanted to go back. Uh, the I yeah. think the the Paul McCartney you go back tour. To the masturbating? No, I okay. want to go back to your youth when you were five. Uh-huh. Um, no, what, the Paul McCartney tour. I think I saw that same tour Flowers in the at uh, the Hollywood Bowl, and I remember when he started to play a Beatles song. A chill went up my spine, and I was not like a giant Beatles fan. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I knew I liked them. Sure. But I'm not a music guy. It's not my. That's not what I do. But it's like you don't realize that you've been hearing that song your whole life. Yeah. Right. And it just when he starts singing yesterday, it's like ah, mm. your whole body just. Well, it, you can gets listen to chill. Paul McCartney play for two and a half hours, and then go home. And on the way home, you talk about the songs he didn't know, play. Oh yeah. He, yeah I know that one. was the crazy part. He, he was playing beat, and it's like I'm like he played fifteen of the most famous songs in the world. Yeah. Yeah, and he didn't play 30 of the other most famous songs. It's completely insane how so many hits. did you see him at Dodger Stadium people. last year? Uh, no, I saw him at the bowl a couple of years. I, I wasn't going to go ever see him again. Yeah. I was ne- I just never no, going to. No, that's a good it's idea. Just never gonna... That's like going back to the same vacation hotel. Yeah. Don't ever do that. It's yeah. just never going to get better than that. Yeah. It's like I used to snowboard and ski a lot, and I caught a perfect day in Chamonix, France, a waist-high powder. I came back, I hung up my skis. I'm like, it's never going to be better now. But now you surf. Yeah, I surf. That's a different story. So what you do is you replace. (laughs) Yeah, but I will will continue to surf. I've had amazing days, but I'll continue to surf. You will. Well, why? Why surf? I mean, because I ski, but I don't surf. But, I mean, they they are sort of similar, right? Same rush? Yeah, no, they're different. But I think I connected more to surfing than I ever did to skiing. Because surfing is freer, right? In terms of it doesn't cost anything to take your board, get in the water. Yeah, that's true. Skiing is a hundred bucks a day is minimum. Easy, right? Easy, and you're probably at a two hundred dollar a day. Oh yeah. With lunch. Now, when I was in high school, I was a ski tech uh-huh. uh, on the east in Jersey, so I skied the Jer- the whole east and that board was it, for Quan- free. Quanic, 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 Quanic. What's it called? My chronic? town. Yeah, chronic? No. Did you oh, smoke Paquanic before you? No, the name of the uh, ski area. Where where were you? Oh in the ski well, area? my town was Paquanic, which is kind of creepily close. That you said. Well, the ski area there. Well, Hunter Mountain was the big one up in New York State, and then uh, Vernon Valley. Was it in the, po- in the Poconos as well? Poconos or? was Pennsylvania. I see. So, oh, that's where I was. was. Oh, that's right. You're Pennsylvania. What was that? Camelback? Yeah, Camelback. That's in the Poconos. Oh, yeah. There's another one too. I don't. I'm <laughs> blind. <laughs> this is for everyone who doesn't care about skiing. All right. Well, listen. Let me get back to my Paul McCartney. You know, yes, I'm sorry. You, you mentioned that he played, you know, 30 songs, that, and he could play yeah 30 more. That he did. and I've talked to several people about why we connected that day and why his guard came down. And there's, you know, people have speculated, but the two that people speculate the most about is and i've narrowed down to these two is a linda died not too long after that you know yeah. i think she did one more tour and then she passed away that could be the reason why he connected to it and the other reason why he connected to it is or another reason why he might have connected to that story was it wasn't oh my god yesterday's the greatest song ever oh my god i saw right. you on you ed sullivan a random, a oh my god tour. right you know, these are non-specific things anyone could say yeah you were like this tour, and probably an album he was very proud of, probably an album that's very important to him. Right. Was Linda on that tour then? Yeah, she yeah, was Linda on stage was, at the yeah, time. she was yeah. on stage. Was oh. she an okay keyboard player? Because she got a lot of slack for not being good enough. But Yeah, I mean, but th- th- that's just going to happen. Yeah. You're going to get slack. She did what she wanted to do, and, uh, and Paul wanted her, and look, man. It, yeah, it's fantastic. You, Wings was and, an amazing, amazing yeah. band. Yeah, band yeah. on the Run alone is one of the best songs ever. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, it is. I remember, I, I'm sorry, you just reminded me. I, I wanted to hear some of the back. So the, the, the guy who you recognize from 60 Minutes, was just looking for teenagers with or people with horrible seats to give these seats to. Right. How amazing that Paul McCartney or his people or whoever is like just had a bunch of they're like, you know what, That's I want to so make kind. sure that people don't yeah. have terrible I seats. I never heard of an obstructive view. Obstructive view, oh, sure. literally on the ticket. Yeah, yeah. And, that's, and I've, 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 now I know, so oh, I've avoided really? those tickets. Like obstructive view gets it behind stage, it's obstructive oh, view. No, they, they don't, yeah, but they don't build them stadiums like that anymore. Like this was the old Meadowlands, he said? This is the... Giant, giant stadium, giant so it's still there, right? at the old, No, no, no. They, they, tore that, it? they tore it down and rebuilt a I'm new not a stadium. Sports, I'm not a sports fan. Yeah, yeah no, that they tore that down. So and, it's a new giant stadium. And they have a new giant stadium where I'm sure there are no obstructed views. But what, like old Comiskey Park, mm-hmm. which, where the White Sox played in Chicago, it was built in like 1913, and I went down there once, and I was like, this is, I love old shit. Mm-hmm. And then I'm sitting behind a post going, well, this is fucking bullshit. Did you ever try and watch a <laughs> baseball game where it's like, no good. You see the guy hit the ball, and it goes over the black space in front of your eyes, and then on the left, a guy is trying to. It's like you have no idea what's right, playing. Right. You've never sat in obstructed view. I don't Christine. think I That's have. That's amazing. Now I do, I do, and I like the part of your story when you talked about going down to the field level because uh-huh. when you're at a concert, everywhere you sit is so different. It's like, oh, I see now what it looks like, right, right. and you get to the field well, level. Christine and it's is like, the king oh, or well, the queen, I, I should say, of moving down. 
<laughs> oh, she, she yeah? Gets, uh, she, get, she, she gets tickets. That she'll, sounds so can, filthy. Oh, that does sound filthy. I it's can't true. even tell you. No, she will go to the Hollywood Bowl. She'll scalp tickets. Um, I'm really good somewhere, at it. I don't and then know why. they just she spots down where new, things are empty, and she moves down. And spots and it doesn't stop there. <laughs> Further down, some empty seats, moving down, moving down. She'll end up at the box seats. Oh, wow. I learned. I learned just to ask. Yeah, there's I mean, a lot of asking. Because the guy who gave me my Paul McCartney tickets, my my buddy Rich, I was sitting with my girlfriend. He was four rows up. I'm like, hey, can asked. they get two more? Those are my yeah. friends up there, so they gave the me two. The worst thing that can happen is they say no. They say no. I did Let that at Tom Petty you. the other night. Did, uh, you went to Tom Petty at the forum. Uh, no, this is actually the other night. When I say the other night, that you could be last ago. Thursday or four years ago. I know. So. Yeah, <laughs> once you're over forty, the other three years ago is twenty years ago, and last night is last. Last year. Well, yeah, yeah. Listen, I listen to Rock Solid all the time. Okay. Rock Solid with Pat Francis and Murray is one of the co-hosts yeah, along yeah. with Christy Stratton, and uh, I love that show. Oh, it's a great show. I'm and glad so it's to be, all I'm musical. Stoked all the to be time. part of it. Yeah. Yeah. That, you're lucky to be part of it. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah. No, no, that's right. Don't. Oh, no, no. that's awesome. Uh, you're so wait, lucky, Valeriano. <laughs> no, I didn't mean that. Um, okay, They're wait. lucky to have you. That's right. Thank you, Hannes Finney. Okay, Maury. Wait, 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 okay. <laughs> So listen, you do this show called Road Stories. So uh-huh. Basically, you only have comedians on the show. No, I sometimes I'll have musicians. Oh, I see. Like I had uh, the they're guitar also... player from uh, Circle Jerks and Bad Religion on the other day. But the, and the, but there are also people on the road. Yeah, it's all about things. You could that have flight the attendants. They're on the road. You I know, could. That, that sort of thing. I could. When Look at Christine you... trying to get in on this. I was no, but <laughs> know, I'm not anymore. It's so old. Listen, I just recently flew, and boy, oh boy, times have changed. Oh really? Oh my gosh. I mean, I used to, when I was a flight attendant, it was like, if it's not Boeing, I'm not going. Right. There are no Boeings Is anymore, that a man. Sticker? It's Airbuses. It's all, it's a different well, game. Well, you were flying Air France, weren't you? Yeah, so but there's Airbuses Airbus. all over the, all over yeah, the world now. It's I flew Airbus to Atlantic. It's a different world. I mean, the, the comfort level is beyond. No, flying blows. Like, that's the worst part about traveling as a stand up. It just, the airport yeah. just sucks. It is. It's I a know, lot it's of really... before time and after time. And then oh. you're, oh, you're going to, you know, you're going to entertain for these 100 people, which mm-hmm. is great. But you, also, you know on your podcast you can entertain 10,000 people in that hour right right so there's a numbers get skewed yeah yeah, yeah totally. and people are like oh, you work half hour a day it's like no traveling getting to the airport being in the airport flying leaving a different being airport get, right. that's all that's the work I'm I'm not yeah. getting paid for that I'm right. not getting paid to tell Dude, you jokes I just did a tour for the military and uh, stateside and the booker who handled all our flight was like where can I get the cheapest Tickets yeah, to move. Yeah. So oh, we're getting okay. up at three o'clock in the That's morning, driving sad. three hours to That's the airport fair. to catch a six a.m. flight. Do they love you, the military? Do they love? Oh you? yeah, performing for the military is awesome. I man. bet. It's almost, I bet that would be really great, and yeah. it feels good, doesn't it? Yeah. You must I mean, feel even <laughs> how bad would it be to to to, to uh, die as to a comedian tank. in front of these people are in Afghanistan? It's like they have nothing, and you come out and they're like, I d- no, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not entertained by this. <laughs> well, I mean, they're not to get morbid or anything, but there are times when you know they've lost four people in the in their platoon the day before. Yeah, and you got to do a show. You know yeah, what I mean? But I, this ice. tour I just did was stateside. There was you know was I was down that. in the shit in Virginia, man. It yeah, got yeah. pretty hot down there. Uh, there yeah, down yeah. In that was, we're taking some heavy fire <laughs> down, <laughs> on a, down off just... Chelsea Peak, <laughs> Chesapeake <laughs> Bay. Can I just tell you the my most recent flying story? Now you went first. You went. Air Business France. class. Business class to Air France. Okay. I know. Oh, That's sweet. nice. That's a sweet I place. went with uh, my fiance Sherry to Atlanta on Frontier. Now, I so didn't even know they still had an airline. The, I don't think they know either, actually. <laughs> so you fly to Denver because you have to fly to Denver because that's where they have their own terminal. And we so we fly from Atlanta to Denver on the way back. And then we're, we're, no, no, no. I'm sorry. We're supposed to fly at like 9 a.m. out of Atlanta. Uh huh. And you get there, and everybody's got their things, and they start getting texts saying, delayed, delayed, delayed. And eventually, it, like, there's not a single employee of Frontier Airlines to be found anywhere. Right. The 9 a.m. flight gets canceled, and we all get put on the noon flight. Again, not a single person has come and told anyone this because they don't exist. I see. If people didn't have their iPhones, we'd just be sitting there. Right. Well, airlines don't show up at the the terminal necessarily until until the flight is ready to prepare. You know what I'm saying? In other words, like, but if you they, would think if, if, if they if cancel front- a flight. They would some, send somebody out to go, this flight is canceled. Come back here Why in two hours. Why did you take it up with Frontier? Why do you take it Why up with Why are you flying Murray Frontier Florida? to begin with? <laughs> <laughs> what is your problem? <laughs> Where are you going? Are you sitting next to a woman with a chicken in a cage? <laughs> Why are you flying Frontier? Isn't Delta because based out of Atlanta? <laughs> oh, F Delta, it was, by the way. Uh, they can fuck. They it can was, suck. <laughs> I, they're the scum of the earth. I hate that airline. <laughs> Well, what? because it was, we went on miles. I see. That's why oh, we okay. went. We, that, that was, was part of it on Greyhound? 
with you the woman with the chicken gets you in the back of her pickup truck <laughs> with her okay. cousin's they, they seat. Flew on feet. One of the smartest things a, a headliner ever told me early on was when you play Vegas, don't gamble your check away and just pick an airline. Pick an airline and stick with that airline. Interesting. What do you mean? Just, just so you collect all the miles. Oh, miles it's going to yeah. suck up front. Yeah. But you're going to. It's worth it. But every once in a while. Yeah. Okay. So, no way. We should. Okay. Delta sucks. You said, and I've heard that from other people. What's your favorite airline? Virgin. To fly? Virgin. Virgin. Yeah. Okay. Virgin. Virgin. What's your they second got it favorite? going on, man. Uh, I, then it's all shit after that, as far as I'm concerned. Really? Yeah, because we flew American on that tour, and they sucked. And, yeah. you know, and Delta, it has become a bust to the sky. It, it really, really is. is. And then people are like, um, especially grandparents, I remember when we used to dress up yeah. to get on an airplane. Pan Am, Yeah, Eastern. well, I tell you what. Don't treat us like fucking cattle, and we'll dress up. But you know what yeah. they're going to say to that? They're going to say, then pay the price. Because the thing is, honestly, flying right now. Is she and still I, fucking I, carrying depends. a card for the airlines it after depends. all? No, no, it's on the week. It. it depends on the month. But honestly, you can get a ticket to Vegas for 150 round trip. And 20 years ago, you get a ticket to Vegas for a 150 round trip. So what happened is that the fuel prices went up. The landing prices went up. The rental space for the, for the, for the gates went up. And airline tickets did not go up. And, and, and labor costs went up. And so all these things go up, and then nobody's paying for it on the other side. I'm just saying that's... No. that's well, this, and is also for, like, this is what you call podcast gold. Right? <laughs> Listen, here's what I want to ask about. I'm sorry, what were you going to say? <laughs> I apologize. Very well might cut that out. But what? here's no. what I no, want to No, do not cut that out. Please, I'm begging you. Okay. No, Delta needs to hear. And I will take them down. <laughs> I'm story worthy. I will take that company down to their knees. Here's what I want to ask you because yes. we got to wrap it up. Right. But your story, Good, okay, calling. your podcast called Road Stories. Yes, ma'am. It's on the All Do Things you, Comedy Network. That's right, All Things Comedy, ATC, I believe. ATC, they call it. not to start a fight. At first, I thought it was side show and yeah. At first, I thought it was uh, like jet, air traffic jet, control, the... but it's not air traffic control. It's All Things Comedy. It's All Things Comedy. Oh. Yeah, everybody thinks when that you're it's on, on the that show. Industry. Uh, do you do you like to talk about comedians who fancy themselves comedians but then are not comedians? Or what is that riff? There seem to be like legitimate comedians, okay? You're a legitimate comedian. Right. And then legitimate comedians get pissed at people who say they're comedians and maybe they're really not a comedian. Like Steve O. Like Steve O, okay. like Adam Carolla, like I wouldn't put Gervais. I wouldn't put Carolla in the same with Steve O and Gervais. Okay. Uh, Carolla is Carolla is one of the funniest people out there. I, I think so too. He yeah. motivated me oh, to Oh, Ricky start Gervais. This That's interesting because I saw his stand up special mm -hmm. and it's like it's not that there wasn't anything funny in it. But none of the material was above stuff I saw in Milwaukee. Well, he's not a stand-up. Chicago and, 50 years ago, yeah. And if you if you have watched, they did a, a a special on HBO with Ricky Gervais hosted it and had Chris Rock, Louis C.K., and Jerry I, Seinfeld. I watched that, yeah. And they gave him no stand-up props. They yeah. gave him, and at one point, uh, Chris Rock says he does an hour 45, and Ricky Gervais goes, an hour 45? And Chris Rock goes, yeah, I don't have the office. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I do this. This is what I do for a living. This yeah. is how yeah. I raise my family. I yeah, don't just write because TV because you're shows. a funny guy doesn't mean you can do stand up. That's right. not. The, it's not the same. Thing. Like and that. it's what kind of what Steve O did. He took his fame and then yeah. took it to a comedy club as opposed yeah, but to. I, I guess. I guess. Okay, this is why. I'm and by the way, stapling you. your ball sack is not funny. Well, I mean, it's funny. funny. It's not well, stand up. No, it's it's not funny. Yeah. Stapling yeah. your ball sack is funny. Stapling yeah. my ball sack. Not funny. See, no, I disagree. I, guess I, just I think, think stapling myself, your ball really? sack is hysterical. So I guess By the I, way, it's funny. It's not stand up funny. That's what I, I meant to say. I feel like. I feel like. But if, Does he have if a podcast somebody on this network? can hold an audience and make them laugh and get their attention with just their voice, I say they're a comedian. Well, the guy doing the fucking Chewbacca, Harry Palm. Well, bit. well, well, actually, he was I'll to disagree. That audience. No, but I'll disagree. Uh, uh, but just this, because. If you can, if you entertain your audience, you are an entertainer. Mm -hmm. And uh, now the truth is that he's not a comedian. You know, Steve O is not a comedian. He is an entertainer. And if you're entertained, then that's a, and they, you ask the audience doesn't parse like but this. But who gets to they don't say? Get, who, who, no, but this is the, comedians are obsessed with defining comedy. That's what I'm sure, trying to that say. Is, that's that is what the problem. Of course, it's like guilty. They're talking that's about. What I'm no, to say. it's like nobody. The audience doesn't care. Okay, no, they don't. That's they what I'm don't to say. care. They don't. Like you know, uh, Jay Leno was literally the best stand-up comedian I have ever seen and in many my people life. People back and you I've up on that. I've seen him. I saw him before he got the Tonight Show ten times live. Fantastic. Yeah. Even probably when he, a even when he times guest hosted, even Letterman. when he guest hosted the right. Tonight and Show, probably better than awesome. David Letterman yeah. as a stand-up. David Letterman, infinitely better host and broadcaster than Jay Leno was, even though. You know, I agree. Okay, so I, I agree one hundred percent. So it's written, like these are two different skills. But to people on watching TV, they're like, 
their TV shows, and they're not thinking about that. We're yeah, I think I think we're the angry, and I'm not. I don't really give a fuck about Steve O. Um, honestly, <laughs> but you know, it's, it it's, took me five minutes to remember who that was. By the way, it's. It's he's touring. This is the thing that pissed me off about Steve O. He was on a morning talk show and he said, Well, what's different between me and other comedians is I tell true stories. <laughs> and I was just like, Drive me over to that station and let me shoot him right now. Yeah. Because yeah. every good I comedian see. tells reels. He's just I telling see. stories about blowing a tranny and then, you yeah. know, get, shoving a bottle of Coke up his I ass. I guess I just feel like there's room enough for everybody. You know, there's I, not. I'm such yeah. a liberal. At well, heart, move to fucking Switzerland. I just feel like <laughs> no, but I feel like everybody can get their own audience. You can't take from somebody what they're not getting themselves. If Ricky Gervais can can command an audience, then he can command an audience. But don't you think that's a? And again, I'm I'm, play, not I'm playing devil. No, I'm, I'm playing not devil's going advocate here. I'm playing devil's advocate here. But don't you think that's belittling? But that, I don't, that but somebody's I, I guess, art form I'm where I was like oh I can do that because I've got a hundred million you know a hundred yeah. thousand followers on Twitter so I'm going to go get on the comedy I guess stage. I just feel like don't look what is beside you don't look what is behind you look what's ahead of you I, I mean I'm just saying like like same with podcasting okay there are a thousand storytelling podcasts now right I'm not Road worried about it. TV, you can get it on iTunes <laughs> all thanks to Comedy Network <laughs> I'm not worried about them I'm really okay. not I mean oh, yeah, I, me I support This American Life I support The Moth I support a lot of different storytelling shows I guess I just feel like the waters rise with the ship or there's something there ship rise uh rising tide rises all ships right a rising tide gathers no moth right exactly. no moss moss the moth. The by the, the moth. way hey you want to play some shotgun story worthy i do Music can only mean one thing. It's time for Shotgun Story Worthy. The game where our storyteller spins the story worthy wheel of truth and tells a true one minute story about the topic it lands on. So, everybody, say it with me Spin that wheel! Okay, I got the beach. The beach is. I have hundreds of stories about the beach because I surf every day of my life. Um. When you, when you when you surf, it's much like being an astronaut. You can tell the level of of maturity when uh, they ask an astronaut, "Where do you pee?" It's the same uh, when you ask a surfer, "Do you pee in your wetsuit?" Of course you do. It keeps you warm. The other thing they ask is, "Have you ever seen a shark?" I see sharks all the time. Um, but one time in particular, we, we were we were surfing, and there was a great white in the lineup, and I saw his fin. And nobody reacted. There's like 100 people in the water. I'm like, all right, I never get picked for anything. I'm not going to get attacked by the shark. <laughs> so he kept swimming around. Then he showed up again. He kept swimming around again. Nobody reacted, so I'm not going to do anything. So I was uh, surfing with my friend Chris. She was on a longboard. I was on a shortboard, meaning I was up to my chest in water. And uh, she was on a longboard, so she was up a little higher. And the great white came up, kicked his tail, and nosed her, bumped her nose on the, uh, uh, the nose of her board and almost knocked her off the board, took off, swam away. And that's when we decided to paddle out of the water. <laughs> oh my gosh! Wow! Really? Yeah. And 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 where was? By the way, Chris has that story, not me. That's which, not which, technically yes. my story. Which that's Chris's story. That was Topanga. Yeah, but you saw it happen. Yeah, it was. Were well, it happened. Scared? Chris was about as far away from you and me, so it I'm just hit her lap. Yeah. <laughs> Were you shaking? This Stapling is my balls. Terrifying. Uh, no, that's a little unnerving, but, uh, no, I mean, you see them all the time. And what do you mean a great white in the lineup? What's that mean? A great white shark was, uh... Well, it's the lineup, I the guess. The lineup is where you line up to, to catch the waves. It's where all the surfers hang out. And you okay. don't, you don't take somebody's... I, I've never surfed. Okay. So you don't take somebody's space, is that what you're saying? Uh, gen well, generally... Well, you have to be side by side, otherwise you'd, you'd surf into the back of somebody's... Right, right. I feel like I mean, they it's, are it's always scattered. surfing into one another. Well, no, they're not. You're not supposed to, and that's what starts all the fights. I see. Yeah. So there's fighting? Uh, I've yeah. seen Beach Blanket Bingo. There's uh, Eric Von Zipper. <laughs> yes. And he. And uh, Potato uh, Bug. Yeah. That is so upsetting that you just threw that reference out. I I've been watching a lot of Nostalgia TV, and they've been showing a lot of those with these, like, the, the, the people are supposed to be teenagers in there, and that's Fruticello, and those people, they're like, 30. Right. <laughs> Eric Von Zipper was at least 58 years old. Was he the bad guy, or was he. he... Was the, Eric Von Zipper was, he had, a, he had a biker gang, and they had black. Motorcycle with uh, uh, Harvey Lembeck. That was, was the that, comedic that's his, his, sidekick, right? His name was Eric Von Zipper. Oh, he uh, Harvey Lembeck he, was Eric I'm Von pretty Zipper? sure that's okay. him. And he was like 58 years oh, old. Oh yeah, totally. And he's like, ah, these kids, and he'd go down and get in a fight with the with the uh, with the kids who were surfers. Right. 
That's and exactly like, what happens. I mean, beat he up looked like he had murdered fourteen people, <laughs> and then and, and and Zippy or you know somebody would throw sand in his face and be done. He'd drive off a cliff. Buster Keaton was in all these movies too, which is Jesus bizarre. Christ, the Beach Hannes. Boys were in uh, What's playing music me in those. Is that we need story worthy our podcast. We need Twitter action. We need Instagram action. We need all this action. Right. And th- here and you're watching right. Beach Blanket Bingo. I'm telling you, this is you know forget about lesbians. This is what moves the needle. You 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 put Eric Von Zipper in the in the Google search oh you know thing gosh. that we're gonna get Mary, a lot of work. Let me ask why, you why do they why, why do, do you guys fight? fight? Why do you guys fight? When well, I come here? <laughs> why do they fight? I first of all I don't fight. Um, Surfing really? What is that? It's actually it's a lot more lore than it is actually happening. Um, it's territorial. It's it's all right. Surfing is very. Very dangerous, and I'm not condoning it fighting in the really lineup. dangerous. Isn't it's it? not like you would see on Beach Blanket Bingo, where it's all sunny and everybody's <laughs> yeah. riding and in the I same way. I would think wave. that the biggest uh, hurdle is the rocks, the beach, the beach, the floor of the ocean. Uh, yeah, I got caught uh, on lava rocks in Hawaii and ripped my back to shreds. Mm. Um, but you know, a lot of times you'll get people out there who've seen Beach Blanket Bingo and, they, and, and right, will they paddle out onto like a ten foot day, not know what they're doing. And what, when a ten foot wave day. Yeah, a ten foot mm-hmm. swell day. What ten foot swell could have like fifteen foot waves. Wow. Um, and you just get in trouble. You get hit with another board. I, I know got a friend who has 27 stitches in his face because yeah. somebody's fin caught him in the face. Why don't I have, surfers ever wear life jackets? They do in the big waves. I see. Have but that's ever, like... Well, it sounds like you almost have to wear helmets. I'm not they, kidding. No, some people do wear helmets. I got a friend who wears a helmet. He started up in San Francisco, and his friend got scalped by Ooh. his... On a rock, so he wore Oof. he wears a helmet every time. Have okay. you ever Even surfed in those, in those huge waves? Uh, probably the highest wave uh, I've ever surfed was probably about sixteen foot face. Wow. Do you, do you want to do that? You want to go around catching uh, those big sixty waves? foot Mavericks jaws? All that's no, nah, that's not really my thing, man. That's yeah. like that's like toe in surfing. You got to have a jet ski that's to pull right. you in, and I I just like being down in the water. And, and the, people the, go to like the Philippines and Indonesia, and they yeah, try yeah. to catch the my biggest friend is actually, waves in the world. And you have to tr- like I could so I. It's easy to say, but I could surf those waves, but I couldn't survive a wipeout because yeah. my friend is training to surf Mavericks, and it's like a two-year training thing. Yeah, so what you have to be able to do is survive when it goes wrong. Yeah, you, probably a lot of people could do it if if they don't fall, but that's like climbing. That's like climbing a mountain. Right, it's right. It's fine exactly. if you don't fall off the mountain. Yeah, yeah. And you it's could, not just surviving uh, and holding your wits. Not the, panicking. Panicking is the biggest. Yeah. Is what the shark you, thing. It sounds to me, from the way you described it, like nobody wanted to be the first person to be like, "Oh, there's a shark." Oh like, no, there was, was there... one. New, there was one new guy who just lost his shit, and everybody was like, shit, "Dude, yeah. shut up, relax, yeah. stop spazzing out." If right, you're, if you're afraid, just get out of the water. So yeah. did he? Did he get out? Of, yeah, he you got all out of the did. water. You all did. No, well, I got out of the water about an hour later when oh. he when he bumped uh, Chris's board. But so the sharks can easily be there and not attack anyone. They're there right now. They're always there. As yeah. a matter of fact, the <laughs> the <laughs> that's <what's>, so zen, <laughs> Murray yeah. Valoriano. The sharks they're are always, always there. there. They're yes. always there, man. Just because we happen to be there and see one doesn't mean they're not there when they're not there. Right. You really do surf every day. Almost every day. The waters. The ocean's been broke for the last couple of weeks, so there hasn't been much. What's surf. that mean? It just uh, there hasn't been. Pr- uh, producing much surf because it's been so much moisture in the air and it's been raining and a so wind is a big factor that kills it uh, no swell in the water that kills it it usually the pacific usually dies down around june it just happened uh, a little earlier this year <laughs> somewhere in in wisconsin right now somebody's listening to this going fuck you yeah <laughs> fuck you yeah, well, sometimes you have, sometimes we have to put on long pants yeah, yeah that's, that's the worst the, yeah that's the worst the other day on somebody and uh, i saw somebody I, I know back in milwaukee put on facebook it was like it was like may 10th and they said frost today may 10th fuck that was the whole <laughs> that was the whole post it was Let like it. yeah i people get mad you know i grew up in jersey and people get you know get mad at me i'm like well i left you yeah, can leave you know, yeah it's a free country <laughs> it's a free country get you can i don't get up and out. i That's love I, I love parts of wisconsin man parts of wisconsin oh no no parts of, i mean it, it's, so i just I. hate snow and i, I would say winter. about milwaukee is christine will say to me why do you wax rhapsodic about well she would never say I that would about, never about, say about wax rhapsodic yes yeah, about milwaukee and it's like there's only two things wrong with milwaukee the weather and my relatives. <laughs> Other than that, it's one of the best cities I've ever been in my life. But those two factors were enough to drive me out. Now I have to look up ubiquitous and raps waxotic. Yes. Yeah, those are two dictionary. huge words. Raps waxotic. I like rap. Wax rhapsodic. And so, listen, Wax congratulations on Rusty Cow. Oh, and thanks, folks man. Can find that, Crack the top 100 on iTunes. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. You can, and you can find that on iTunes. iTunes you can also get Amazon. it on Amazon.com and all that. I'll sign a copy of Murray Valeriano. Yeah, Don't get me wrong. So, so is, is there a difference between a comedy album and an audiobook? 
Uh, is there applause in your audio in your in your comedy album? Is there a what? The, applause. Is it the live? album is recorded live in front of an audience? Yeah, yeah, it's recorded oh, okay, live in so front that's of an audience. The difference, right? Yeah. Okay. So oh, an audio book. You're like when uh, not just stories. John it's... Cleese read from Pitt to LAX. Is yeah. that what you're talking about? <laughs> oh, actually, that, that would right? be even better. I said no. I said Anthony Hopkins, but John Cleese would be oh, much better. Hey, thank you John so much Cleese for coming today. Awesome. Oh, thanks for having we me. Really I appreciate it. I apologize that it's been so long. I know. I wish it hadn't been, but now you're here, and that's what's important. All right. And next time, that's all that's important. I'll come and tell the story about when I met Steve-O. Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> that'd be great. My boyfriend. <laughs> All right, you guys. We're going to wrap it up. He was in the bathroom at the BAFTAs right stapling a, his balls. Right about now. <laughs> I'd like to thank everybody here at Sideshow Network, including Andrew Steven. Thanks, Andrew. Of course, Maria Spertolozzi and Sean Merrick. And on behalf of John Thomas Griffith, you know, he's the guy that wrote the theme song, Follow Me. Uh, yes, and he actually, what he does is like to take his balls and he stretches it out like a banjo string, and that's when he <laughs> so plays it. And, of course, on behalf of our storyteller tonight, Murray Valoriano. Thank you again for coming. Thank you so much for having me. Really yeah, appreciate I'm it. And on behalf of you, Hannah Spinney, my dear friend and co-host, my name is Christine Blackburn saying, make it a story for you. Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe to Story Worthy on iTunes and visit the Story Worthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. Follow me.